Um, as a self-introduction, I'm Carrie Armel. I'm a research associate at Precourt Energy Efficiency Center. And I develop energy saving um, programs, various kinds, so community-based is one, but also online browser applications, games, incentive programs, and I also develop evaluation techniques and evaluate programs. Um, so for example, because we're going to be talking about the community-based programs, and so we may have discussion about various types. Um, so one of uh, a couple that we've developed in collaboration with Tom Robinson at the School of Medicine is a Girl Scout program that is currently being disseminated nationally, um, and as well as a high school program. Um, and, and both of those, it's for the the, uh, the adolescents or the children, as well as their parents. And in both cases, we ran randomized controlled trials, which d demonstrated energy savings. Um, so zooming back out, there's different types of programs, like I said, community-based, median marketing, incentive, et cetera. And, um, and each of these programs have different pros and cons. And so community-based are great for a variety of reasons that our speakers will go into some more. But to mention a few, um, because there's one-on-one -on -one contact, people can trust the spokesperson more. Um, they're salient because you have this interpersonal and social aspect. There's norm effects. Um, you can see what might be more relevant because what uh, solved the solution for somebody like me probably is going to map better onto my situation. Advice can be personalized, et cetera. However, there's, there's various issues, and, and we're going to get more into this through the presentations and hopefully the discussion. Um, they can be harder to scale cost effectively because if you're paying the labor to do the programs, um, that can be um, uh, labor can be quite costly, and if you're not paying the labor, the fidelity or the consistency with which the, the program is uh, disseminated and replicated can deteriorate. So, um, so without further ado, we'll um, uh, get started. We, we have three fabulous women today. Um, Kat Donnelly from Azentive. Uh, Jillian Rich from PG&E, and Sandra Slater from Cool City Challenge. And I'll give you a little bit more background on them before each of the presentations. So we'll start with Kat. Um, Kat's the founder and CEO of Azentive. She's managed numerous large-scale, community-based behavior and cultural change energy initiatives. And she holds two master's degree and a PhD from MIT with a focus on energy efficiency, clean energy, and behavior change and is also a licensed engineer. Thank you so much. Glad to see a good turnout in this group. Um, we're going to talk a lot about community-based social marketing type programs, local programs, and we want to make this very interactive. So we've saved a lot of time for questions. So we're excited to have you here. Uh, my framing comes from over 21 cities that we've worked in, that we've done program design and implementation of these programs, um, community-based local programs, mostly focused on energy, but sometimes we focus on other areas as well, residential and commercial. I'm going to focus a little bit more on commercial today, since the objective that I see is supercharging the Silicon Valley and you know, getting us to the next step with energy efficiency. And I think it's going to come from a lot the business community to lead that and a lot of public-private partnerships. So these are probably obvious things to you. More than 30% of a typical commercial and residential building's energy use is wasted energy. A lot of opportunity from a carbon perspective, a money perspective. And then the second one may not be quite as obvious. Um, what we know is that staff costs account for 90% of a building's business's operating costs. <clears throat> and that's important for a number of reasons. One, that means that the energy costs are about 1%. So oftentimes, it's not even something that you know, businesses are thinking about. And so what they are thinking about is their staff costs. So when we think about these programs and how we engage across the companies, it's very important to engage at the worker or the staff level, the employee level, because happier employees mean more <coughs> profitability for companies. It means um, people stay longer, less turnover, those types of issues. So that's the framing. I'm going to talk a little bit about the behavior science, why are community-based, local, targeted partnerships effective in engaging individuals. 
The number one reason why they're effective is because we make the vast majority of our decisions based on social, culture, and emotional factors. So while we can all stand here and say, I'm very rational, I'm an engineer, I like to think of myself as rational, but the bottom line is that is not how I make decisions. So we're social creatures. We do what other people do. I mean, just quite frankly, that's what we do. We look to others to model behaviors and to see what types of behaviors that we want to take. And so this is very important. The number one reason why people do things is because we are social creatures. So always keep that in mind um, as you design different programs or, or do different programs in, in your communities. Trusted messenger influence. Again, this is a social, another social behavior aspect. Um, we look to people that we trust to help us make decisions about what to do. Uh, we have some great examples. One of our program, the Connecticut Neighbor to Neighbor Energy Challenge. Uh, in this program, we, we did a lot of trusted messenger influence. And um, one of the things we did was, if we wanted people to get audits, we would start with a local politician. And we would ask them to invite the media in. And after we would do that, hundreds of people would sign up. A great example from that program, and Jillian knows this one well, we've talked about it a lot, is we were in the, a city, a little town called Cheshire in Connecticut, and uh, we're having trouble making traction. And we started asking around, what's going on? Why can't we make traction? And what we found out is we needed to talk to the horse commissioner. We didn't even know what a horse commissioner was. <laughs> you know? And so we got the horse commissioner involved, and this program took off. And what happened was we got earned media out of it. If you can't read the slide, it's a guy using lots of energy sitting on his couch, and he's saying, I don't know, honey, what do you think? Should we sign up for this neighbor to neighbor energy challenge? They started hearing about it from trusted messengers. People need a reason. Um, not everybody really cares about climate change. It's something that's out in the future. It's nebulous. So we try to pull in the core values and the reasons for people to take action. Oftentimes that reason is it's the right thing to do. Don't underestimate the power of it's the right thing to do. All right, so how do you do this? We, do, we, we have three main things that we like to talk about. Go where people are already going, engage how people are already engaging, and serve up the what's in it for me factor all very important, you know, get to the core value of why people want to be involved. Make sure you don't make it hard for them. You go to the local organizations that they're already involved in and you engage how they're already engaging. I'm just going to give one example. This is Envision Charlotte. It started out as Smart Energy Now. We were hired by Duke Energy to design the marketing outreach for this program. It was a first of its kind citywide in um, 21 million square feet. There were 64 out of the 68 building owners that signed up for this, and lots and lots of people across the city. It was a city of, uh, the, the potential market was 75,000 people. Um, the goal was 5% savings from behavior change and 15% from operational savings. It was a very much a top-down and bottom-up effort. So it involved public-private partnerships from across the city. It's really important to get the municipalities involved and other trusted messengers. And, um, and it involved top-down leadership at the building and company level. Then there was the bottom-up aspect of it. We trained over 1,500 energy champions, and these guys were the people that went out and spread the message. You know, these are your trusted messengers. These are people that get really involved and really excited, and this is who needs to spread the message. You know, it's not us. We're not the trusted messenger in this case. Um, we did a couple of, well, several, energy efficiency action burst campaigns, and these were focused on two behaviors, turning off lights and powering down plug loads. That's it. Just very targeted, simple focus. Um, ran town halls, did social media, sent blogs, gave toolkits for running these campaigns individually, did a lot of crowdsourcing. What are your ideas for what types of campaigns we should run? That kind of, that kind of thing. And the results of this were 6.2% energy savings within 18 months across Uptown Charlotte. And if you look today, they're almost to their 20% number. And so very exciting. A program, and if you want to learn more about that, certainly get in touch with me, and I can tell you more about that. It's a lot to cover in seven minutes, so can't cover all of it. So how do you go forward with these types of programs? Lead from the top. 
very, very important. And I do think it needs to be a public-private partnership, and it needs to be partnerships across the community. Um, you got to find the local trusted messengers, and as I said at the beginning, the business community is very, very important. And guess what? There's profits to be had from this. So it's not something that's going to cost money in the end, the long term. The profits are incredible. We see 21% increased productivity. Um, sometimes uh, we've seen across companies five and a half percent or five and a half times increased revenue, seven and a half times increased profits. Huge dollars when you get your employees really involved in these types of programs. Model these programs from the middle. So this is train the trainers, partner with the local community organizations so you can get to their networks and go where people are already going. And engage at the company management level so that people have permission to do these programs while they're at work. Mobilize from the bottom. You know, grassroots movements are incredibly effective um, and a very important part of this. We want to enable our sustainability champions and we want to motivate our individual participants to take action and to spread through word of mouth. All right, so here's my equation. You know, it's obviously very simplified. Took out all the variables. But applied behavioral, social, and building sciences along with I believe it needs to be more than about energy efficiency. It needs to cross across sustainability, climate resiliency, and wellness. You know, how do we make our communities well and more healthy? And then combine this with healthy profits, people, and places. So what we at Azentive try to do is redefine the way businesses optimize their triple bottom line. We want to develop these, these um, collectives of communities working together. So you can think of a community as a floor of a building, a department, a whole city, a neighborhood. We're going to see examples of that in the next two speakers. And then create these culture change programs that, cause, that create spillover at work and at home. And you can see a lot of success with them. So my seven minutes are up, so I'll stop here and we'll get to questions later. Thank you very much. So next up is Jillian Rich. She's a manager at PG&E in the San Francisco headquarters. Um, as part of the Energy Efficiency Organization, Jillian manages the Workforce Education and Training Team, which aims to provide California's energy workforce with the necessary skills, tools, and resources it needs to meet California's energy and climate goals. Jillian graduated from UC Berkeley School of Environmental Design. Thank you. Okay. Oh. Wonderful. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. All right, so I'm here to talk about a local example from the Bay Area um, of how we implemented a lot of the ideas that Kat spoke about just now. And she was a consultant on this project, and I'm excited to recap it. It lasted for 18 months. It went from May 2015 to December of last year in San Francisco and San Jose. So hyper-local. But before we get into it, um, let's talk about why we did it. So a lot of you that have been in the energy industry for a while know that we've been doing energy efficiency for 30 years plus, and we've been doing a widget-based approach. You get a check for doing a certain action. And in 2014, we looked ahead and realized that that's not going to work in the long range. Uh, one of my favorite acronyms is BRO. Has anyone heard of this? And that for, yeah, OK, Behavioral Retrofit Operational. Uh, I think it's one of the funnier acronyms that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis. But we realized that this was the future, a holistic approach to look at a building and come at energy savings from a myriad of sources. And so we wanted to come up with a way to do that. And right about that time, we had new leadership at PG&E who had been involved in Envision Charlotte. And he said, why aren't we doing that here? Uh, a lot of our uh, rebate and incentive programs for energy efficiency are peanut butter. They're the same across the whole territory. We need to have a local approach. So thus, Step Up and Power Down was born. Uh, our mission was a big one. Uh, we wanted to have that messaging, that social messaging, that commercial and industrial buildings account for nearly half of the nation's energy use. We set out to change that. Um, and so we came out with this. Uh, I took this slide from one of our earliest decks. I went back in history and pulled this one. And it was right when we had come out with our branding. What do you notice that's different from what you normally see from pg and &E, since all of you, I think, live in the area? Anyone? You can't see the pg and &E logo. Yes, that's great. Yeah, it's tiny on purpose at the bottom. What else? 
Okay, I'll give you some hints. The font, it's, it's whimsical, you could say, fun. Uh, we don't use the pg e bright blue, it's a dark blue. Um, there's, it's all, all about, we wanted to have a bit of a different marketing campaign, make this fun, make this identifiable, uh, something different, because it was a partnership with the two cities, which I'll get into in a moment. Um, but first I wanna just say, there's three things that were different about Step Up and Power Down as a campaign to market our energy efficiency products. Uh, the first is kind of what Kat talked about, which we also call organization organizational behavior change. It was, uh, we'd historically always gone to the middle man, the facility manager, and sold our energy efficiency products, saying, hey, you need new refrigeration, new mechanical, whatever it was. Uh, this was about going to the top and to the bottom. So it was going to the C-suite and leveraging the mayor's um, networks in order to get them on board with championing sustainability in their workforce. And then it was also down to the individual employee coming up with hand raisers and champions in order to give them something to do because our messaging was simple changes big savings so this is the community aspect even something as small as turning off a light it seems like nothing to you but our messaging was that if everyone in the two cities we picked which I'll tell you are San Jose and San Francisco if everyone did that in San Jose and San Francisco it could add up to big savings um, so we, I said, uh, what was it? Organizational behavior change, community, and competition were kind of the three unique things we did with this campaign. Uh, the competition angle, uh, again, we picked San Jose and San, and San Francisco. Probably wouldn't have been smart to pit them against each other and create bad blood, right? <laughs> so uh, it was a competition amongst themselves. We created goals for each of them, and if each of them met those respective goals, then pg e shareholders agreed to give a million dollars to each one as a reward. Um, so it was a friendly competition, uh, although they, some of them took it more seriously than the others. I will say, since we're in Silicon Valley, that San Jose did meet their energy target first. <laughs> Woo, no one? Okay. They're, they're, they're proud of it. Uh, so we had the mayors on board, and we came out with this program. Again, it's May 2015. Put yourself back there. Uh, you saw banner ads, uh, VTA, and Muni signs, and then also some targeted marketing on websites. Uh, our messaging was, again, simple changes, big energy savings, off is the new on, because uh, this was back when uh, Orange is the New Black was out. Um, and then we had our first ask was for people to pledge, to say, I will save energy. Uh, we had a goal of 1,000 businesses signing up. That means the decision maker in the business, um, and we uh, met that goal, which we'll get into in a second. So we had experiential campa campaigns where people went and got a cup of coffee, learned about energy, and signed up for Step Up and Power Down. Uh, exactly what did they do after they pledged? It was a mix of training, energy audits, behavior campaigns, and facility upgrades. Around behavior, I'll mention that these were some unique new products, right? Because we were trying to combine everything we normally sell to a business, um, again, rebates, incentives, with the behavior. Um, and so we did come up with a way to audit behavior. So not only say what the opportunity is, but what are the social and cultural barriers within the workforce that prevent people from doing that sustainable behavior. Behavior. And we came out with campaigns, and a lot of them are really fun, like Energy Vampire Slayer, uh, one that involves rubber chickens. I'm not kidding. Uh, and all of them are on stepupandpowerdown.com for free download if you're ever interested in doing that on, in your own workforce. So stepupandpowerdown.com slash resources. Um, so we provided this suite of services, and there was an, a solution for every business, whether small or large. And then you saw our marketing shift. Um, we started to um, showcase actual people in the community who had stepped up and powered down. Here are some um, examples of folks from a, everything from a data storage facility to a small uh, smoothie bar. <coughs> uh, and then come to the end of the campaign, the marketing campaign was really about um, showing our energy champions and rewarding them and recognizing them for all that they had done over the 18 months. Uh, I should mention on the left, you can see that I don't, some of you may not be able to read that uh, because it is in another language. All of our marketing was in language and we had actually a really cool contingency of businesses from Chinatown and San Francisco that were very engaged in this campaign. We were even showcased on the local radio, so some earned media there. Um, and so, uh, Again, it was, um, these were real people telling about how they saved energy, and it was to promote people going down their energy journey that uh, we had set out for them once they pledged. So here's how everything ended up, right? You're probably wondering, okay, you 
You showed us what you did. Was it successful? Well, here were our goals. Uh, we wanted 1,000 businesses to participate, and we had over 1,200. Um, and then in terms of energy savings, here I'll pause because this is an industry event. Uh, I want to be clear. So the last thing we want to do is have people sign up for a competition and then say, oh, and then a year and a half after the competition ends, we'll tell you how much energy you saved. Right? That, that's not motivational. This is a marketing campaign. So what we did is we took what we normally would save from San Jose and San Francisco added about a 15% adder, and then they made that our goal. So San Jose and San Francisco, during this campaign period, met with the energy savings targets that they would, they would, they uh, saved as much energy as they normally would, plus 15%, plus a lot more, because you can see here from the graphics that we exceeded our targets. Um, so what portion of that savings is attributable to Step Up and Power Down is uh, currently left to, to be determined. Uh, that's the process that takes a while. And of you that are familiar with California energy savings evaluation know that it's a, a process. So what works and what didn't? Any of you that are interested in doing a community-based approach to sustainability, I wanted to make sure to focus on these. And I think I have a minute. OK. So, oh. No. OK. We'll let you go a little bit over here. Thank you. Uh, so uh, <laughs> first is, let me pick one. Um, what worked is that we feel that we deeply engaged our customers. We use a lot of one-on-one uh, -on -one approaches. And by doing that bottom-up and top-down approach, we uh, had people who thought that they were doing everything right. And then they, they learned that uh, there's a lot more that they could do and created new relationships and open doors that we never could have before. Um, of our 1,000 participants, we had some really big names. There was extremely popular among hotels in San Francisco, uh, the Hyatt, Park 55, uh, Mark Hopkins, uh, also big tech like Salesforce um, and Cisco. Uh, I, I could go on. Um, all of our participants are on stepupandpowerdown.com. So what worked was that um, deeply engaging our customers in a new way that PG&E hadn't currently done. And then also what else worked is the partnerships. We could not have done this without San Jose and San Francisco. Having their name, having their mayor recognize our participants, having their uh, input and uh, working alongside us on the marketing, they knew exactly what messaging to target micro neighborhoods in their community. And so that partnership was crucial. What we could have done better is um, I'll just focus on a couple of these. Tracking and data management uh, was a huge one, and Kat can speak to that as well. Um, anticipating the amount of hand-holding, we tried a big data approach, especially for small, medium business customers, because it's so expensive to go door to door, and it completely flopped. And we had to shift direction mid-campaign, because small, medium business owners just don't have the time to go online and look at their energy, no matter what we do, is what we, what we learned, unfortunately. So uh, we had to go back to a human approach, um, and we'll just have to work harder on figuring out how to make that cost effective. Uh, also building community, making uh, we picked our largest commercial areas in our service area because we wanted to go big. Um, unfortunately, it, it was hard to build that community feel that I think you saw maybe in the Envision Charlotte a little bit better. So we, we need to uh, work on that angle as well. So I'm happy to talk about more of these offline. I'll be around after the session and also in the Q&A. But those are just, uh, from my perspective, five or six of the things that five of the things that worked and what we could have done better. And uh, if we relaunch Step Up and Power Down ever in the future, uh, we will definitely keep in mind. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jillian. Next up is Sandra Slater. She's the California director of the Cool City Challenge. Sorry. Cool blocks. Uh, well, it's both. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, Sandra was a consultant to the Golden Gate National Recreational Parks Conservancy and to Zeta Communities. She's led her own design firm, Sandra Slater Environments. And she lives in Palo Alto in a home that she designed to showcase green principles where she's had more than 4,000 design professionals visit. So, yeah, thank I'll you. Leave it up to you. Oh, I didn't, uh... I can see the oh. uh... <laughs> Okay, well, why don't I while you oh, here do that? Sorry. So, I can I can get started if you like. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay. yeah, sorry about that. It's okay. It's great. Well, thank you. Thanks uh, to the panelists also um, who preceded me. I, 
the program that I'm going to tell you about, the Cool City Challenge and the Cool Block program, is something that's come out of 30 years worth of research and development on in behavioral sciences of what works. And it incorporates so much of what Kat and Julia just talked about, which is sort of the family friendly, the, um, the um, trusted social connections that you have. And it's building on many, many iterations of what works and what doesn't in terms of behavioral sciences. So a few years ago, I was looking for something that was a highly leveraged project, uh, project in the um, carbon uh, reduction space. And while we need great technology, as we're hearing today, and we need great policy, what we also need are people to change their behavior. We need to change the culture around carbon, because ultimately, it's us driving policy, driving uh, technology uptake, and being able to really um, serve as the underpinnings for major carbon reduction in, on the planet. So um, we need behavior change, uh, at bottom line. So here's a two-minute video that comes out of, we're just doing a pilot in Palo Alto. Um, we've got, uh, we're in partnership with the city of Palo Alto. We completed um, our, just our beta. This is coming, this little two-minute video gives you a little bit of experience of what the alpha was like, and it's, you'll see it's a very friendly, kind of open um, approach. When I was growing up, you kind of relied on your neighbors. Most people want opportunities to help each other and they just don't hear about them all the time. Or don't feel comfortable asking somebody. Back when I was in Ethiopia, we really have a community-based life. We, we don't live you know, very independently like we do in America. I, I have this motto, I live to serve. I serve my family here, and you know, using the cool block, I can serve my neighborhood. Where we're headed with global warming is not inevitable. We can stop it. Now I know that I can do it, and my block can do it, and that my neighborhood can do it. I want to save the planet for future generations. You know, I have a son. He hopefully someday will have a family of his own, and they will have a family of their own. And it just goes on and on. I want the human race to continue. I felt it before I had a kid, but now I feel that pressure even more to, to leave the earth for the children, hopefully in a better place than when you came into it. You want to take care of it kid more than just about anything in the world. So, One of the things that we've talked uh, about in the groups is how to organize ourselves, especially bringing together and making a community that collaborates and trades not only objects and tools, but help from one another at different times. Relying on other people, you know, that they can check on me. It's a good thing because I might need the help. The Cool Block program is nine meetings over approximately four and a half months that help people learn carbon reduction, water stewardship, disaster resiliency, livability, and empowering others. It is so simple and so profound. People want to connect with people who live in the same place. The cities are where change is going to happen, and we can do it one neighborhood at a time. My dream is that we'll reinvent our cities, reinvent our quality of life, reinvent the planet, and build the future that we dream of. Victory is just a matter of organization. And that's what this is. It's blocks organizing, which is the most basic way you can organize beyond your own household. It can't be stopped. So there you have it. Um, you see that it's a neighbor to neighbor um, uh, program. Uh, there are five to eight households on a block that we get organized, and we consider a block corner to corner, both sides of the street. So they're the people that you wave to when you come out at your front door, and people you can rely on in an emergency, and people that you can sh start tool sharing. You don't want to go several blocks away to borrow the ladder or whatever. You want to be able to have that kind of social capital right on your block. Um, so the teams meet, as you saw, about uh, every two weeks over four and a half months, and they get to this kind of stuff that's happening in living rooms across these teams that we've had has been really astounding. They support each other, they do knowledge sharing, you know, I have solar panels, come and look at mine, or I have an EV, come and drive mine. Um, this worked, this didn't work. Um, so that kind of building of a social capital is really, really key to the whole um, program. So why does it work? Um, we're really tapping into intrinsic motivators. We don't, um, of, of feeling of safety and of connectedness 
and of making a difference. We don't go in and we know 90 ways not to knock on your neighbor's door and say, come and join us. We've iterated the whole program um, to get really the best, um, the best learnings that we can. So we, um, we've developed a script that goes like this. Hi, I'm Sandra from across the street. So it's somebody you know, it's not somebody coming from somewhere else. I'd like to invite you into my home to learn about a program that's in sponsorship, partnership with the city of Palo Alto, important because it's got the city's imprintur on it, um, to get to know each other better as neighbors, conserve resources for the sake of our children, and to get ready for an emergency so that we can rely on each other if there's an earthquake, and also be able to start tool sharing and doing some other things on the block. So you'll notice I don't mention carbon at all. Um, it is not about carbon, it's about other intrinsic motivators that we have. So with that, we get about a 55% um, uptake on a block, which is, if you know of anything about community organizer, and they said, that's an astounding number. And, you know, why? Because people want to get to know their neighbors. They want, they want to make a difference. They don't know how, they don't have the tools, and they really want the social connectedness and the feeling of safety of knowing your neighbors. I mean, the idea that we're, we are a tribal species, and the idea that we don't know the people who live a few feet from our sleep, a few feet from our head every night, is kind of a an anomaly, I think, in the, uh, for the human species, that we really do want to connect and know our neighbors in a more profound way, other than just a block party, which is great, but not sufficient to really um, be engaged with your neighbors. So we partner with the city and get all, we have Bruce over here um, from the city of Palo Alto Utilities Department, and we got, went around to every single department and we said, how can we help you leverage programs that you're already doing that you're not getting traction with? So, you know, how many bill inserts do we read? You know, not very many. So that's not a very effective tool of, of engagement for these wonderful, I mean, the city of Palo Alto has amazing programs um, all throughout the city to help um, residents engage um, on this issue and other issues, water, stewardship, zero waste, um, safety and resiliency, but people don't know about them. Um, and so we're giving the, the city an ability to really leverage all those programs that they already have. Um, so the proof is in the pudding. What is, you know, what are our results? We've had 95 uh, households already. We've uh, reporting. We have more households. A lot of people are not interested in going on and documenting their um, data, M maybe because they don't feel that that part is important. What's important to them is getting the stuff done not necessarily reporting, but we have 95 households over this uh, uh, piloting uh, period. We had 55% participation, as I said, on the block, which is amazing. We, the average carbon reduction was 14,000 pounds per household for annual. Um, that translates to about 25% of the car carbon um, for a household, and that includes everything from systems in the house and efficiency, behavior change, turning off the lights, that kind of thing, to um, uh, air travel, and we've had some wonderful iterations of things. That this is the kind of stuff that happens, is one woman works for The Gap. She said, you know, I have to do airline travel for my, for my work. I, can't, I don't have a choice. So she went in. When she saw her carbon footprint from her air travel, she was just blown away. So she went to The Gap, and she said, look, don't make me fly, and if I absolutely have to fly, at least buy carbon offsets for me. So that was just, you know, one little thing that's happened that can sort of ripple out um, onto other parts of people's lives um, when, when they start becoming aware and changing the culture around um, carbon. They completed an average of 24 actions per household. That's across all the things, water resiliency, res um, emergency prep, carbon reduction. Um, and they've had over 2,500 separate actions that have been done by the population so far of these 95. So how are we gonna get it to scale? Um, that's always um, a difficult question, and that's sort of the next phase of the pilot, is how do we get this? Uh, we're following the work of Everett Rogers. Some of you may know him, because he was a Stanford pro professor, talked about, you know, uh-oh, his work, I'm almost done. Um, <laughs> uh, he coined the phrase, early adopters, early majority, late majority, and laggards on the bell curve. If you can reach 15 to 20% of a population and an idea can scale, is scalable, it will scale on its own, it'll go viral. So it's kind of the tipping point. Um, so we're trying to reach 25% of the households in Palo Alto. What happens to the culture in Palo Alto when people are demanding goods and services, do, taking advantage and living a low carbon lifestyle? 
you know, 15 years ago, taking a bag to the grocery store was like, oh, my friends would say, oh, she's such a tree hugger. Now, if you don't take your bags to the grocery store, it's like, oh my God, I hope nobody sees me. I, you know, I, I have them in my car, really, I do, but I just forgot. Um, so that's a cultural shift. That's a, that's a change. You know, when I'm in New York and there's no place to put a bottle or a can because there's no recycling, it feels weird. Those are the kinds of things that we're looking for writ large in a community. What happens um, in the community? So scaling it, blocks beget blocks. We already have our uh, teams who are saying, wow, this is so great, and talking about it in their book clubs and their friends and all the rest about the program. We're, gonna, we're in partnership with the city, and we would hope that the city would really make it part of their whole um, smart city, cool city campaign of really engaging neighbors and saying you need to do it. Um, we want to get utilities involved. Um, of course, we are very lucky with the city of Palo Alto utility. Um, we have technology partners we'd like to engage with, and of course, corporations who can also help start helping us get their their employees to go to their blocks and do it in their homes. So we're looking also at affinity groups like the Boy Scouts and faith-based groups and saying, look, from this group of co our congregation, we only need five or 10 block leaders and then um, go from there. So that's our scaling strategy and we're really hoping to get to the 25% of the city of Palo Alto's blocks and then see what happens um, with that. So that's it and my contact information and I'd be happy to t answer any questions you may have. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks so much, Sandra. So I think we'll stay seated here. Um, I, I'm going to uh, open with a question, and, and then after we answer it, I'll, I'll open it back up. So be thinking about what questions you'd like to have. Um, first off, I just wanted to say that, that these three programs are, community-based programs are very hard to do and take a lot of work, and they're hard to scale, they're hard to get impacts, and require a lot of iterations. And so on face value, it, for, for folks who uh, may not have done it, it may seem sort of uh, obvious because you know how to talk to people, but it's, it's actually uh, quite uh, difficult designing these and, and getting them to scale. So I commend our speakers on fantastic programs and fantastic jobs. Um, I, I also just want to um, clarify one thing, because uh, the speakers uh, mentioned the word behavior a lot. And in the utility world, uh, the utilities specifically define behavior as sort of habits or repeat actions. Um, but I think most of the speakers here would agree with me that they're referring to it in uh, much um, broader terms. And so um, the term behavior can refer to people changing settings, people purchasing technology and installing it properly, um, can uh, refer to changing everyday habits, performing maintenance, et cetera. So, um, so it can have a, a much more sizable impact in energy reductions than simply changing uh, habits would alone. Um, so to get to my question, um, the, the term scalability came up a few times in the presentations. And, um, and to obviously to see, the, uh, to see large population-wide savings, we both need to have uh, deep energy savings per person, but we need to get lots of people involved. And in a community-based program, because it's people doing the communication by definition, the cost of labor is, can be relatively high. And so how do we get scalability, um, period, because it's difficult to get scalability, but also how do we do it cost effectively in the context of these programs? So that's what I'd like to open up to you guys. Do you, you know, why don't you go first? You want me to go first? Yeah, sure. Is that on? Is that on? Yeah. yeah okay. Um, so, Scalability is difficult at the beginning. You know, these, these programs do follow very much a hockey stick curve. You know, at first you feel like, oh, I'm not making any progress. Mm -hmm. This isn't working. And then all of a sudden, like Sandra referenced, you get this tipping point. And um, one of the main ways that we get sustainability in our programs is by going where people are already going. So going to the local organizations that they're already involved in. In the Neighbor to Neighbor Energy Challenge, we had 134 local organizations mm -hmm. that went out and promoted the program for us. And um, you know, it took a while to get them on board, but once we had them on board, 
it, it started running on its own. And every single program I've ever worked on, we've done that same thing. So working with the cities, working with the counties, working with local governments, working with the utilities, working with the local organizations is very, very important. And the other thing I would add is um, doing a train the trainer aspect of this. So we've seen lots of programs where um, it's a little bit scary, but you just let the program go. You train the trainers and you say, go do this your way in the way that makes the most sense to you. And so that's, that's another way that we get sc scalability. I'll just um, riff off of something that Kat said. There was uh, decades ago in the Pacific Northwest, um, there was a, a program run by Bonneville Power Administration and a bunch of other organizations up there. And over, I believe it was a three year period, they ended up getting something crazy like 90% of the population, the households involved in doing some energy upgrade. And they did it because they had so many organizations mm -hmm. involved at, mm -hmm. at different levels, different clubs and government officials and just everybody was involved, so yeah. Yeah, yeah so I don't wanna minimize how, how much it, it does cost a lot, and um, especially when you're trying a social innovation, when you're trying to prove something, it's never been done before, and we're working with the city now and trying to get some funding. We have a matching grant, um, and you know it's like it's a little bit like pulling teeth because it, it's something brand new. Um, what we found is um, what I told you on my scaling side: affinity groups going to Elks clubs and Girl Scouts and all the rest, um, and just trying to get a few from each one of those and then have it go viral and the teams beginning teams. Also what we did was we had the coaches, like the training of the trainer, we had people who'd been through the program who then for the next group decided to be a coach. So I got 25% of the people, no 30% of the people from my first group to be coaches for the second group. So they're helping, now I'm gonna be recruiting from, from this next group to be helping for the, so you know there are ways of doing it and ours is all volunteer at the, at, you know, when you're actually doing the program. Getting the program started, it takes a lot, as you say, it takes a lot of administration and a lot of work. And unfortunately, cities and municipalities and, and, and corporations and others aren't necessarily banging it down on the door to say, let's try this, because it's unproven. And we're hoping to have Palo Alto be a model city so that other cities can come in and learn both the stuff that worked and the stuff that didn't work, but you have to be willing to take a risk. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I'll just add a few comments. So scalability was one of our primary concerns at PG&E. We have 240 cities in our service area, and so we had a lot of questions. Well, why just these two as a pilot? How can we scale to the rest if this is successful? Um, so we, right out the gate, we're thinking of scalable solutions like the high-tech uh, SMB, small medium business outreach mechanism that I mentioned. Um, and it was a big learning lesson for us when it flopped. Um, we realized that community-based means community-based. You need to use the community you need, you need to use trusted messengers. If we're going to do this, you have to do it right. And so we really shifted direction and used the city as our messenger for small, medium business and completely turned it around, ended up meeting our goals and getting a lot of good feedback from our small businesses. Um, so in terms of how to make it more scalable, yes, partnerships, that's primarily what we did. With business associations, chambers of commerce, hotel associations were great at getting the word out for us. Um, and... I'll, I'll stop there just because of time and I want to go to the next question. Okay. Well, I'm going to open it up to the audience, so feel free to, to let us know. I have some more questions if nobody has some, but um, any questions about specifics of the programs? Sometimes it's pretty, oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Hi, um, James Talea. I'm currently on the board of Carbon Free Silicon Valley, a climate action advocacy group in the area. Uh, mm -hmm. I was at pg e Energy Efficiency Group with Jillian for seven and a half years. So um, before I left, there was um, a lot of uh, uh, effort to try to get the CPUC to um, allow more for mm -hmm. behavior change mm -hmm. programs. And it's hard to measure, as you all know. Um, and I'm worried that the, the, for those types of programs that are funded, and overseen by the CPUC and others like them, how do you, you know, are they moving uh, toward um, 
a better understanding of how to drive this and being okay with some things that don't work. Uh, yeah, there was certain definitions in CPC rulings that were very restrictive and I don't remember the details anymore. Um, is that gonna keep things from moving ahead? Uh, how do we push for um, getting these large cultural shifts that we mm -hmm. need to have happen? Otherwise it just maintains this you know, two to 5% participation rate in these kinds of programs and we never really get anywhere as an overall uh, mm -hmm. you know, culture. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure, great question. Um, so as background, our regulators, the California Public Utilities Commission, currently the only uh, approved behavior change program for energy efficiency is our uh, home energy reports. Maybe one of you, some of you have gotten them. They have a smiley face or a sad face according to how you compare to comparable houses in your area. Um, so it's the only program, and what we do does not currently count, uh, but we do have a working group creating a new definition of behavior that would help with some of, um, have these programs count um, and get at those, uh, those bro savings, right? My favorite acronym. <laughs> um, and so we're working on that, and it's part of our new, our plan that's outlined in uh, a, a business plan we just submitted to the California Public Utilities Commission pending review, hopefully by the end of the year. Um, so if that gets approved, then we'll have more um, flexibility to go this way. Um, the California Energy Commission and California Public Utilities Commission, they put out a roadmap of how we're going to achieve our energy efficiency goals um, as a state. And that draft report just came out for the 2018 year and beyond, uh, and it's in there. There's a whole appendix on bro, so you, you can read it and know that we have to get there. It's just how we get there is still being worked out. I want to say something, but you can go first if you want. Okay. Um, so I'm going I'm to dodge the question just a tiny bit because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step around it. And I'm going to say, you know, going back to what Carrie said, we believe behavior change goes across every single action that happens in the mm -hmm. building, all the way to, um, you know, deciding to retrofit your building, whole building retrofits. I mean, every single thing you do. And technology also crosses across every single thing you do. Um, you can't believe sometimes with turning out lights, it's literally a technology problem. People don't know how to use the light switches often. Seems silly, but it happens. And so I, we like to think of that continuum, the technology behavior continuum. And that's really important as you think about these actions. So the, the way I would think about a little bit getting around this, this barrier that we have right now is thinking about other leaders of these programs. Like maybe, maybe it's the cities leading them. It's a nonprofit organization like Envision Charlotte. It's something like that. And then the utility is a partner of these programs. They don't necessarily have to be the leader because there are so many regulatory barriers for them. And we're leveraging, mm -hmm. like Sandra mentioned, we're leveraging all those great utility programs that they do have approval for, and they don't. it doesn't um, cause that same barrier. And so that's how I would think about it right now. It's a little bit dodging your question, but I like to work within existing frameworks and see how we can make these things happen, given all the barriers that we have. So I have a little bit of, 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 a, of another work around your question, which is, it's not only for us, it's not only about carbon. Mm -hmm. I mean, carbon is a big part of it, and it's my bottom line, and it's why we have the program. But how do you put a number on social capital, building social capital? How do you put a number on resiliency and getting ready for emergencies? How do you put a number on people sharing tools and getting to know, you know, all that stuff that... It, and that's the, the hard part is getting, for instance, in the city of Palo Alto, is getting all the departments to stop being siloed in, mm -hmm. you know, just my thing and looking at a more systems approach mm -hmm. of all these things and how do they inter, how are they interacting and, and um, so that's my, my like, I, it's like you want to beat them over the head, you know, <laughs> but um, we're certainly running into that and, and if you're looking at a regulatory um, entity um, like the PUC, they're not going to get that. They're not going to get the social value, the resiliency value, and everything. They're not going to put a value on that, which is too bad, because mm -hmm. it is going to make our whole culture that much more resilient to um, things that are going to come down the pike. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a, a couple points, too. So, um, so there have been several independent papers estimating that the 
the energy energy saving potential of behavior programs again covering lots of different actions that people would take because basically anything you do to implement energy efficiency requires some element of behavior but that we it could reach a potential of of um, population wide 20 percent energy savings from programs like that and yet the state of the art program gets one and a half percent energy savings so there's a huge discrepancy there like you said um, so um, so you raised a few good points as to um, obstacles in getting there and one was the, the uh, measurement and evaluation and um, and we have we now have in California, Texas, multiple other places, basically entire states where every building has smart meter data, and could be used to evaluate these programs. And you know, if, if we track when people were exposed to things, maybe when they went online to do something, et cetera, I mean, we could pretty tightly couple the energy saving impact of these programs. Um, but it's been difficult to get the energy data, and why? Well. Individuals themselves are disinterested in energy mm -hmm. data. We've tried very hard to get people to sign up. And it's, it's very difficult to get energy data directly from utilities. Um, and we tried for years, and I could tell you stories about that. Mm -hmm. um, and the, um, the PUC and CEC have um, tried giving some access to like aggregated data and stuff, but it really doesn't help in the evaluation of these programs. And so that's one barrier, <laughs> one issue. And then there, a second thing is that the funding to do these programs is a challenge and currently they're funded through ratepayer dollars going mm -hmm. through the PUCs and then being channeled for utilities. And the utilities have basically been gatekeepers to, uh, to implementing these programs. Well, the utilities, in states like California are regulated utilities and they're, they're very conservative and they want to do programs that have already been demonstrated to be effective. They're not, you know, the startup companies that are going to develop programs and try all different things and experiment with it. And I've, I've raised this issue to um, former commissioners and, and stuff like that, but it's not been adequate quickly solved. If there's not a flow of money into organizations that can be more fast moving and implement and experiment, we're not going to see that that big jump unless there's some clever workaround that nobody yet in the space has thought about. But because people have been hammering on this for for multiple years now, and people leave the field when they figure out that you know they're not going to get funded to do something innovative. So that's my my take on it. Can I just add one more sure. thing? And I think you know I love the work you're doing, and I think it's organizations like you that make a big impact. And then it's also businesses and residents looking at the other co-benefits that come along with this, right? And Sandra alluded to it, but from a company perspective, the co-benefits that come along with an engaged workforce are huge. Mm -hmm. And even just looking at productivity, you know, 21% increase in worker productivity, that pays back in a few days. So um, these types of programs can be cost effective mm -hmm. if you pull in the other savings mm -hmm. and co-benefits that come along with them. So that's another way that we think about that. Yeah. That's workaround. a great point that, that yeah. you guys made. Yeah. Yeah. And I just want to address the, the innovation point. It's a good one. Um, this was our attempt to be startup-y, um, and we learned a lot from it. Um, and in terms of where we're going with this, the energy efficiency world is changing. If you're not a part of it, it's a good time to be engaged. And by sometime next year, 60% of our portfolio of our money, of the ratepayer money, is going to be um, outsourced. So programs that are completely designed and implemented by uh, not PG&E or not the other California utilities. And so we do have an opportunity to change the way we do things and get it more stranded potential for energy efficiency. Um, and so we're embracing the change and preparing for it as we speak. It'll be a big one. Great. Yeah. Um, so as a takeoff from that, I was curious how Quick preface, like about a year, or no, about six months ago, I was at a conference in, on the East Coast in New York City, and it was like 500 of the top, uh, you know, corporations, you know, 500 Forbes top corporations at their own commit forum. So for all the, the you know, community social responsibility officers of big corporations. And, you know, the whole theme was, oh, lo, lo and behold, the circular economy. And I was just wondering how you all, uh, d does that even, you know, does this framework even, does, does that meme or that theme ever, even ever even come up anymore? Or, or for them it was all new, 
And yet there's data that says 38% of you know, CEOs say there's no business model for a circular economy, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just curious, now if things are going to be outsourced, uh, what, what happened or what is happening with the circular economy in your sphere that you're speaking of, local community? Can you define that? Yeah, sorry. Oh, well, very good. Uh, well, circular economy is saying, you know, uh, from along the whole supply chain, right. Uh, if everything is recycled and everything is, you know, taken, oh, okay. you, you know, like l l little butterflies, but it, the, the whole big picture is is uh, does everything, all your resources come from a recycled So it's cradle-to-cradle cradle kind of? Yeah, cradle-to-cradle. Yeah. Cradle yeah. cradle. yes, 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 yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, do you want to take a start? I mean, if you, if, you, if you have no answer, that's the answer. I mean, that's... Yeah, I mean, I it's, think, it's no you know, problem. fundamentally, my feeling is yeah. we have to shift. I mean, the corporations have to stop thinking quarterly and quarterly right. quarterly reports of being their driving force on whether they're successful or not. And, um, you know, of course, for me, it's like, do we all need an electric drill in our, in our sheds? You know, it gets used literally 10 minutes to 20 minutes every 10 years, and we all have them. We all worked for them. We all went to the store. We bought them, and they're sitting there. Do we all need them? No. I mean, I don't need the drill. I need the hole. I don't. I don't care about having the drill. You know. So, um, so I think you know, corporations are going to have to start thinking in a different way around resource use and about you know the whole um, uh, plant obsolescence and all the rest. We can't s sustain the planet if everybody wants to live the way we do in the U.S. It's you know two and a half planets worth of resources. It's not going to happen. So, or it can happen, but it's going to be to our detriment. So, I think they, they, corporations are going to need to to figure out how to do this. And I think you know there's there's shifts. I think the millennials are very different in their way they're purchasing, the way their values, what their values are. Um, a lot of kids don't have driver's license. I mean, for my kids, 16, wow, they were out of the house with the car. They drove four blocks to Pally, and I was Miss Sustainability, right? It was like, drove me crazy. But now kids are not even getting their driver's license. So there is a shift, and, you know, the whole, I think the economy is going to have to shift. And, frankly, I feel like our lives are going to be better. Um, I have an aspiration and a vision that our lives will be better if we stop gobbling up the resources so quickly and that we need the more circular economy. But I'm not in the corporation, the corporate world, but you... You might have more insight into that. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure how to answer the question. I'm sorry. Well, no, it's not even something that even yeah. comes up. Uh, well, I will say that we are going to a longer term planning cycle as a state. Normally, we have a plan for energy efficiency in two to, th well, one to three year stints, and now it's 10 years. So we are making uh, going at it from a more holistic, long-term perspective. So hopefully that will help. I think we had a question in the gentleman in the white shirt. Did you have a question? You well, raised your hand a while ago. I thought. My name is Eyal. Um, regarding the community-based, have, have you considered partnership or looked at a company like uh, Nextdoor? Yeah, uh, Maybe we have, because, because we have talked, yeah, yeah we, we talked to Nextdoor a couple, few years ago. They're very transactional. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like I have this for sale or whatever. Mm -hmm. right. Nextdoor is fabulous. Mm -hmm. I love it. I use it all the time. Um, mm -hmm. But it's not, um, it's not really allowing the social capital to get built. Um, that what we're looking for, um, it, it's sort of on your, and next door is also like your whole neighborhood or your whole city, um, not specifically your block. Um, and uh, they are actually looking, or at the time, I have to go back and circle back to them, at the, looking for some added value to just the transactional. They actually do want to start building community. And I saw Facebook today made, a, they have now a new, moniker which is building community not just about connecting people so I think there are there you know everywhere I look of course it's a hammer you know seeing a nail everywhere but I am seeing people saying community building community it's about uh, you know the divisions of the of the left and the right you know the or the blue and the red states we really need to start building community we need to start bridging and we're only going to do that when we start relating to each other um, and so that's one of the ancillary benefits that we have. Just one comment. There was an example from Nextdoor a couple of weeks ago. 
to go next to there was a demonstration organized against San Carlos Airport in the South. Right. So it was a lot of activity yeah. going on. Yeah. I think you know those those kinds of groups are starting, and certainly Facebook is now uh, doing that a lot. A lot of that. Mm -hmm. My name is Ben Meita. I've been ex EPRI, ex PG&E, ex Energy Commission. So <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, I've seen energy efficiency. I manage energy efficiency for the large commercial industrial customers in Silicon Valley. What motivates people is money. If you connect energy efficiency with very direct incentives, money-wise, people will do it. I mean, large commercial customer I had, they would not touch it unless they see the money. And I think the same psychology applies to me and you, you know, at my home level. If I can see some benefits, I'll do it. But I, I don't think that picture is very clear. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I take an well, issue with yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> so, so the amount of energy, if people make significant, energy is so cheap at least in a lot of places. The amount yeah. of energy people would tend to save in their home, they're spending more money on a cup of coffee right. each day. So when, um, when I've, because we, we've explored all sorts of motivators with people, and when I've kind of pitched money, people, er, everybody, everybody, when you ask them, everybody says money. Mm -hmm. Money would right. motivate me. And then you show them how much money, and they're like, Forget, Forget it. it. I'm not even going to do it. Why should I waste my time doing it? Yeah. So I'm curious if you could elaborate on some different angle because I don't see where that's well, coming across. All of us as a get $100 plus monthly bill from PG. Mm -hmm. And if I can show that I can save 5% of that bill doing something, I would do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, With the incomes not everybody in this will do area. it, but people will do it. <laughs> Yeah, five dollars is. In yeah. This area? It's that proverbial cup of coffee. That's five. That's one cup of coffee, a month. That you're saying that you know if you go through do all this stuff, you're going to save five. You know, one the worth. What we found is that information is not enough. You know, all of us know what we're supposed to do, but it's actually doing it that is the hump. We, so information in itself yeah. isn't good. Financial incentives are, are in and of themselves aren't necessarily the driver. Um, protest isn't necessarily the driver. There are all kinds of ways that you can affect change, but they're limited um, in their scope. And I think the Carrie's right. Second <laughs> point, Silicon Valley has just gone green. I just started buying green electricity in Yay. Cupertino. Mm -hmm. And that's an organization that Great. can promote this kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I would, you know, uh, ask your coaching or whatever ways to convince them that, hey, it's a good idea. I mean, this Palo Alto concept that you have developed, is it available in Cupertino? I don't know. Well, not yet, because we're still piloting it, but it will be soon, I hope. Yes, so I think, <laughs> and this next door is an excellent site. I can go tomorrow and just input my thoughts of what I learned here. Mm -hmm. and a lot of people will read that, and that will start. So we don't even have to wait for the next door organization to do this. I and uh, individual people can just uh, express their opinion and it will, it will powerfully multiply. Yeah, well you need to get the, the municipalities or whoever to pay, somebody's gotta pay for it. So yes, you can do it, but somebody has to sort of build the infrastructure to do that, so. No, 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 use the next door infrastructure. Just I as a user of this, I, I'm gonna to tell tomorrow that this is what I heard. It's a good idea. And then right. I'm, I'm sure people are going to ask me, but how do you do it? Yeah. So, so yeah. just just use uh -huh. that individual power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So okay, thank you. I, I want to go. I, thank you for your questions. I want to go back a little bit to the money um, question because one of the things I talked about in the presentation is from an individual psychology standpoint. Um, money's not really going to be a motivator from an individual um, basis. In fact, we've seen a lot of evidence in the behavioral science world that once you bring money into it, you negate all of the intrinsic motivations that are out there. Right. So people doing this for the right reason. And so money becomes not a sustainable way to promote these programs on an individual behavior standpoint. Now, when you're talking corporations yeah. and businesses and you're thinking about profit of these businesses and when you change cultures in these businesses and now all of a sudden they're seeing five and a half mo times more <coughs> profits out of their businesses, okay, that's a motivator. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the, the research, um, even I think it's coming out of EPRI actually, was that for time of use pricing, if you wanted to get any impact out of the time of use pricing, you literally had to make the rates 10 times more right. than mm. the other rates. So money can motivate at the individual level, but only at a really, really, if it's very painful 
for you um, and if you frame it correctly. And there's a lot of ways to mess up that framing. Mm -hmm. But from a business standpoint, um, I do think money and profits is a motivator right. and something we should take advantage right. of. Right. Thanks for bringing that up, Kat. That's an important point. Yeah. yeah. I think, you know, too, uh, there's a famous experiment where they tried to get people to um, recycle. And if you recycled, you get $5 off of your bill or whatever. And then they did a lottery thing. They said, if you recycle and have a certain threshold, you can win $1,000. Mm -hmm. And of course, it went way up. Because the $5 is meaningless. But $1,000, wow, I have now a chance to win $1,000. Change. I mean, we're weird animals. <laughs> we are just, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so... Um, I, we also saw this in Step Up and Power Down. Uh, we thought the million dollars that we gave to each city of our corporate money um, would be motivational for businesses. So one of our messages when we went in was, hey, your community could win a million dollars and that could be put towards a community benefit, like a climate action plan or a playground. And it backfired. Yeah. They did not, they said, well, how am I, what, what piece of to that me. is mine? Right. <laughs> what, what portion of the million am I going to get? What a, and it turned the whole conversation negative. So we uh, changed our messaging. We tested our messaging. Uh, we also surveyed participants ahead of time and they all said money was the number one thing. But you know, when we went in and used mm -hmm. that money messaging, it, it didn't work. Definitely. We have data on it. Um, so they all went with the green angle. The sustainability angle and climate change worked a lot better in San Jose. I'm sorry, in San Francisco, uh, funny enough. Um, in San Jose, we did have targeted success with the dollar savings pitch. Um, when we went in cold and asked for participation. So again, just it's so important to know your community and respond to it and come at this as a process and not a baked solution. Yeah, and I think one more comment on that is we as humans think we understand our motivations. If you ask people, are you doing this because your neighbors are doing it? No one will tell you, yes, that's why right. I'm doing it. Right. <laughs> but the fact is, you know, we don't, we're not going to admit that as human beings. We're like, no, I'm making rational decisions. Right. And I'm doing it for rational reasons. But we don't make our decisions that way. So yeah. I think we, it's really right. important to which is keep why that we're in mind. Which, which is why we're not going in with carbon. We're going in with all these other things. You know, for instance, for me, I have built this home and I live a sustainable life. I have all my, all, you know, throughout my life. But I was woefully unprepared for an emergency. I mean, I had water and a first aid kit and the thing that you get from KQED when you give two, 200 bucks. <laughs> but that was it, right? And so I'm getting, because I have a team now on my block and we just went through the program, I'm now, it's something I know I should do. I knew, you know, for years I've been thinking, oh, I really got to do that. But there's no deadline, there's no accountability, there's no support. And here with my group, there was accountability, there was support, you know, people, we shared ideas. Oh, I got a thing at Costco, it was a side of salmon, and it's good till 2022, you know, smoked salmon. So I'm going to be eating salmon for when there's, a, when there's a, an emergency. So those kinds of things, are, so you, people go in for all different kinds of reasons, curiosity to look in somebody's house, because we, we have shared, we have shared leadership, every group, every team member has a, a meeting in their house, so there's shared you know, all these sort of things that are brought in that are intrinsic motivators because mm -hmm. often when you're stating it's either money or, mm -hmm. or other, you know, carbon, it's not necessarily a, a I'm going to feel free to come up and ask questions, but we're over time now and there's, a, there's lunch and a mm -hmm. lunch debate and I, I, w I don't want to keep people here. So thanks so much for participating.